This is a pendulum. Not too interesting, right? No fun in that. You know, it's just, what is it doing? But take it and actually rotate it upright. Now we have an inverted pendulum, or a pendulum that's upside down. Hang on, listen to me, do hold your tomatoes there, Buster. I'm not finished yet. Take a look at these videos. You might notice a key pattern in between each of them. There's some kind of bar that's attached to a pivot that moves back and forth in order to balance it. This is a control problem commonly known as the inverted pendulum or the self-balancing pendulum. You see it anywhere. Rockets, segways, even old people. My leg! Uh, he's okay. One interesting application of this problem that I've seen is called a wheeled inverted pendulum or a self-balancing robot. It uses a set of two wheels in order to help stabilize itself in the upright position. So I thought to myself, you know, I like robots. This doesn't sound like too high of a project. It might take about, you know, a week or two, right? Right. Before I show you how I made this hunk of plastic, we need to do a little bit of physics to understand sort of the system that we're working with here. So let's imagine that we have a really simple bar that's attached to a pivot that can move horizontally left and right. Gravity always acts down, and so the reaction force of the pivot is what's keeping the pendulum from falling down, unless the bar moves a little bit. If it rotates even just a little bit, there's going to be some distance from the center of the pivot and the center of mass of the bar, and since there's a gravitational force at some distance, it's going to cause a torque on the bar and the pendulum's going to fall down. Now we need some active control system that can determine whether the pendulum is vertical or not and is falling down so that we can move the pivot to be right under the center of mass of the bar to keep it stabilized. In other words, we need to measure the orientation of the bar. We can do this by measuring the angle of the bar and comparing it to the desired angle, which in this case is probably going to be around zero because we don't want the john to move. If we were to sort of summarize this system into like a block diagram, it would look something like this. We have our assembly, which is essentially just the pivot in the bar, which is using some type of sensor or measurement device in order to measure the orientation of the bar, or in this case, the angle. This angle is then compared to some sort of reference signal. In this case, our reference is just zero or the desired angle that we want the bar to be at. By subtracting these two, we can get something called the error of the system. And this can go into some sort of controller that uses this error and sends a command to our assembly in order to get the robot to balance. But a question still remains here. How do we actually do this step here where we're actually measuring the orientation of the bar? Well, one super important sensor in robotics is the IMU, which stands for the Inertial Measurement Unit. This is basically just some really, really fancy microelectronic device that uses really, really small masses and springs with some fancy electronics thrown in there to convert motion into an electrical signal. Typically, two sensors are employed, a gyroscope, which measures like rotation rate. So in order to measure angle, we would need some kind of integration done. And accelerometers, which measure linear acceleration, which we can use trig for this using gravity and the forward motion of the robot. If we combine these two sensors together in some type of sensor fusion algorithm like complementary filters or common filters, it gives you an estimate of what the pendulum angle actually is. Now we need to determine the type of controller that we're going to use with the error that we've now calculated from the IMU. One easy controller that we can use is called a PID controller, which stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Control. And the equation for it looks like this. Now ignore the disgusting equation that I put in front of you. It's gross, but it's actually pretty intuitive if you think about it like a spring. The proportional gain is kind of like a spring. The proportional gain emphasizes the pre present error of the system, and so the more the P gain is, the higher the reactivity to error is. Kind of like how a spring with a higher stiffness will react with more force against higher deformations. Think of the D gain as like a damper. The derivative emphasizes how fast the error changes, and so it makes the system more reactive to changes in error, or higher changes in error. More intuitively, this is kind of like how fast the pendulum is falling in our case. This is kind of like how water pushes back on your hand harder when you push it faster. And then we have the integral gain, which basically just, I don't, I don't know, I don't really have a good analogy for it, it's just, it just sort of integrates error over time, so it kind of helps add more command to the system if it has a lot of accumulation of error. It didn't really help in my project, so I didn't really end up using a very heavy eye gain in the first place, but it can be useful in other applications. 
Anyway, how did I actually make this robot? I'm not very creative, so I kind of just started off with a basic structure of how the robot actually is going to look. And so I made this like little rectangular tower frame. It has some circuit mounts on each section to help mount the different circuit boards. Um, and I initially made this out of wood because I kind of wanted to blend woodworking into this project, but my handsaw skills are absolutely abysmal. Wait, 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 wait! So I made it out of plastic instead with my Ender 3 printer. How I actually ended up getting this thing to move is I used a series of motors, I found these cheap gear motors on Amazon with these wheels that came with them, and I just hooked them up to this motor driver I found online called the L298. It uses pulse width modulation in order to control the speed of the motors, so basically the higher the gain coming out of the control output or control algorithm is, the higher the speed of the motors. So we can essentially vary the speed or how fast the motors react to the conditions of the robot. This is all powered by a pack of nickel metal hydride batteries, a boost converter, and an Arduino Uno to power the motors through the driver and get the motors to vary in speed. If you're wondering why I chose nickel metal hydride batteries, it's because I'm super scared of lithium batteries and I don't want to blow up my first project. What the fuck? The hardest part of this project definitely was actually making the controller in the first place and actually tuning the PID gains. The idea here is that you want to tune each gain individually and try to maximize their benefits as much as possible. But I found that eventually you just have to sort of increase or decrease numbers together and sort of watch the performance over time. For example, in a lot of cases I noticed that making the proportional gain higher sort of caused the robot to sort of overcorrect itself. But if we think about this like a spring, it'd be kind of equivalent to having if we had a really high P gain. It would be like a spring that has really high stiffness. That experience is a really high deformation or error, and so it's going to oscillate a lot. If you do this, if you have this spring in something like water though, for example, it's going to smooth out a lot of that oscillation and it's going to cause the spring to settle to equilibrium faster. And so this is where increasing the derivative gain comes into play and helps sort of dampen or smooth out the oscillations of the robot. This has the effect of making the robot act like it's having a nervous system breakdown, but this sort of reactivity is what you want in order to prevent the robot from overcompensating itself. The degain is kind of predicting how large the oscillations are and sort of pushing on water harder, and so it's applying a heavier force and, you know, preventing the robot from overcorrecting itself too much. What's kind of cool about this is we're basically making a virtual spring in a robot without using any sort of actual spring components. Kind of cool. The beauty of robotics. <laughs>